What happens when your dollar is worth less than everything you buy, but more than other currencies? I'm going to show you and give you full spectrum analysis as to what's happening with the US dollar, compare that to other currencies, and show you what's happening with central banks and their inflationary policies. Let's begin by taking a look here. Your steak is getting cheaper at the supermarket. Prices fall as demand softens for higher end cuts and staffing improves at processing plants. So of course what we had in 2020, couldn't get enough people in, that's still happening to some degree today. People are saying, at least they were saying that, I don't wanna deal with this, I'm not going there, they're not paying me enough, I'm gonna just sit at home. That's not happening to the same degree it was two years ago. At the same time, you look here and we have to understand that when there is demand destruction, that's going to have an impact on businesses. That's going to have an impact on people. Look, if their steak that people were buying was, let's just say, $5, and now it becomes $8, it becomes $10, people start to cut back. And maybe they go to cheaper cuts of meat. Maybe they say, ah, you know what? I can't do it anymore. I'm not going to have it one once a week. I'm going to have it every month. I'm going to have it every three months. So suddenly there's more availability and you see that happening in many different factors. It's with restaurants, it's with food itself. And you look at all these other things and they start to really show us how we can be impacted by changes in the price, whether that's from the supply chain factors, whether that's from inflationary factors caused by the central banks. Now you look here at what's happening with the currencies themselves. So we compare the euro to the US dollar and over the last year, it's just been down, 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 down. And we look at it right now where if you can believe it or not, the US dollar is worth just a little bit more than the euro. If we pull this back five years, you could see what happened. There's been a couple instances where the euro was 1.25 to the US dollar. You look at where it was at its peak in 2008. It was almost 1.6, 1.6. And now today, they're basically at parity. What about the British pound? I mean, this has been the same situation over the last year. You can see that chart declining. It peaked out over the last year at around, let's say, 1.4 to the US dollar. And now today, 1.17. Things are changing. It is not what it once was. Look, this instance here back in 2007, the, can you believe this? The British pound was over two to the US dollar, today 1.17. You could see that we compare this, but also look at the US dollar index itself. This has been rising over the last year. So we compare them against each other. But what about compared against food, about goods, about your energy prices and all these things? Everybody is feeling it. I'm going to show you the surveys that really indicate that today. And of course, what that all means. Look, this is just giving us an idea of what's happening in the bond market. The bond market is often going to send a signal that is very strong. And you're looking at the 10 year and it accelerated beyond 3%. So uh, basically this is one of the most watched indicators. This is going to have a direct impact on what happens with mortgage rates. And we can see that they are significantly higher than they were uh, not that long ago. And there had been many people who said, ah, it's not going to go above 3%. And of course, not only did it do that, it did it multiple times. So watch out very clearly uh, who you take your advice from. Okay, you got to be careful. Wall Street bears take revenge after a $7 trillion rally. So this is funny because there's this argument of bulls and bears. But of course, if you're just doing it how you should be, there should be no bullish or bearishness ever. It should simply be uh, your ability to... Uh, make money, take money from, from the market. That's the way it works. So this is just showing us what has happened here over the last little while. And of course, what do we see? We see inflation going up. We see the stock market simply ignoring the Federal Reserve and what they intend on doing. They are increasing interest rates, whether they will uh, do it more than they had previously thought it would be. I mean, it's just ridiculous because they didn't ever think they would see a 75 basis point hike, and they did it two times. 
And now here we are again. Are they gonna are they gonna increase again? Or are they just gonna cut? Like they just don't want to believe it. It's this it's this false sense of reality that some uh, individuals have. But of course, that keeps the market going. So you could see actually uh, when you look at it uh, based on many factors, 200-day moving average. You look at um, just, there's just so many. If you, I, I didn't pull up these charts in particular, but you see it in a technical analysis standpoint and over and over and over again, it shows us that the market doesn't have the strength. Now, why in the world would they not have that strength? Is it possible, just possible, that without the central banks behind this, without the Federal Reserve pumping out cash like they were before, that they do not have the strength to continue their acceleration as strongly as they did before? And that is absolutely the case you've got inflationary pressures everywhere and you see that certainly there's the supply chain factors but do not discount what's going on with the central banks as you see rates increase as you see the balance sheets even staying flat if they were staying flat they started to decline a little bit but they have actually started to go down as a result of this on a global scale going down uh, as a result of this this is going to have a direct impact on the financial markets, and we can see that. That is very clear. Anybody who's denying it is simply ignoring reality. The global central bank balance sheets had declined by over $1 trillion. That happened right under our nose, but that's where we are today. Can you believe it? Now, I want to talk about the next aspect here, and that is the consumer sentiment and what people feel. These things are something you just can't argue with. Okay, this is the data. In the US, poor life ratings reach a record high. That's right. The percentage of people who say they are suffering is higher today than it was during the financial crisis. Can you believe this? The financial crisis. There are so many books written about the financial crisis. There is so much information out there about the financial crisis. And yet today, more people responded to this Gallup poll saying they're suffering now than they were before. What does that tell you about the reality of the situation? We're just not seeing it in a lot of the data yet. 50% of employers expect job cuts, survey finds. There's just talking about layoffs and so on. Whether it is Best Buy or Ford or HBO and Peloton, Shopify, Remax, Walmart and Wayfair, we see it across the board that companies are saying you've got to go. And that happens all the time. It does. We, you know, employers have to get rid of people that are not performing. But is it just a few people? Is it just 5% of the workforce? Or is it going to be more, much more? We only know in time. This is all dependent on where you are personally, okay? Because you can see core inflation by region. This is the 12-month change in the CPI, Consumer Price Index, excluding food and energy because we don't want to include things that people have to buy every single day. Uh, just breaking it up. And you can see that, for instance, in the Northeast, there's been less inflation than we've seen in the South for instance, a significant difference in between the two. So wherever you are individually is going to be different, and that's going to have an impact on what your current lifestyle is and how it's changed over the last little while. And that is a big factor. Yes, so we can generalize, yes, inflation is going up, but it depends on you. But the fact remains is that we've significantly elevated that over the past few years. Wouldn't you agree? And then you look at areas like Europe that are just, just have, they have no chance of having any sort of restoration of what happened in, in the previous years of this, you know, low inflation. And why? Well, one of those factors here is energy. German power prices smash records as energy panic engulfs Europe. And the craziest part about all of this is that the belief is that in the wintertime, it's going to get much worse. Nord Stream pipe set for a three-day maintenance from August 31st. Gas settles at a record high while French power and coal surge over and over again. Okay, But... There is a ceiling to all of this. In this case here, home sellers are slashing prices in pandemic boom towns. You could look at this example. Redfin, <clears throat> excuse me, found that 70% of homes for sale in Boise, Idaho had their price cut in July. 
the highest share of the 97 metros. You look at that all throughout, whether it's 70%, whether it's 50%, 30%, it doesn't matter. There are many indicators showing us that a ceiling has been hit and now the prices are falling off of their peak. I've seen many examples in the comments below. Hopefully we'll get more today from people saying, yeah, the homes were selling for a million. Now they're selling for 800 or now they're selling for 900 or what have you. So while, you know, you could say, well, you know, I saw a comparable at a million. When was that? And was it the exact same situation or, you know, what are you really comparing? What were the mortgage rates at that given time? There's a lot. There's a lot. And you stayed until the end. So I wanted to give you a little bit of humor, okay? Because I, you know that if you've been on this channel a while, I like to give you some humor. Now, what if, just what if, you were a cell phone zombie and you never looked up from your phone, okay? You were just staring at it all day. I mean, you, you're you just going to run into the streets. You're going to get banged up by a car. Well, not anymore. The problem has been resolved. I want to thank those in Hong Kong for thinking of this and thinking of you and I, or you and I, the cell phone zombies, well, Red lights at Hong Kong crosswalks are helping phone zombies cross the streets. City targets pedestrians glued to devices with new stop signal. That's right. You could see below, I hope you could see that, where they're standing, and by the way, they're on their phones. Um, there is now a red light shining on the floor because they don't look up to see the lights in front of them. So they're gonna see that out of their peripheral vision and they're gonna be just fine. Can you believe this? I mean, this is the world we live in today. It's just unbelievable. Look, I got a cell phone. I use my cell phone. I record videos on it. I check information on it. I look at the weather, whatever the case may be. But when I'm walking, I don't use my phone, okay? When I'm driving, I don't use my phone. That's just the way it is. And it's just unbelievable to see how glued people are. What are you doing? You're scrolling on Instagram? Not the time to be doing that. You might put something on, use your phone while you're walking. Sure, you you know, you put a podcast on, you put an audiobook. Excellent. But are you going to be walking and, oh my goodness, I see it. I think it's crazy. That's the world we live in today. What are your thoughts? Are you a cell phone zombie? We should start something called Cell Phone Zombie Anonymous. I think it would be great to get everybody together and uh, we can all unite under our cell phone zombieism. All right, enough with the crazy talk. See you on the next one. Take care.